Hello everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics, and much, much more. My name is Sava, and today we are continuing our discussion of econometrics, and precisely, we start a series of three videos on autocorrelation tests. That is, how can we use the existing consensus in econometrics to detect autocorrelation? one of the most pressing issues, one of the most common problems that one faces when trying to estimate an econometric model. How to detect that past observations influence your current observations and that this violates the Gauss-Markov theorem assumptions and that your estimators would be inherently biased. How to detect that this issue is present? Well, today we're going to discuss the simplest and perhaps the most famous test for autocorrelation, that is the Durbin-Watson statistic, that uses the logic of residuals and lagged residuals to derive a statistic that can then be used to generate inferences about the degree and the presence of autocorrelation. So without further ado, let's estimate a basic, a very simple linear regression. Uh, here we've got um, total return indices of the Tesla stock and uh, the relevant benchmark, S&P 500. So we'll just calculate the returns using the simple formula. Nothing fancy here. So we'll just estimate the linear regression, that is, just estimate the alpha and beta of the Tesla stock on daily data for five trading years. We've got, as usual, uh, 1,258 observations in our sample. And then we'll apply the Durbin-Watson statistic to figure out whether autocorrelation is present in our return data and whether our beta estimator that we have obtained from OLS is biased due to autocorrelation. So without further ado, first we'll just need to estimate the um, simple linear regression. To do that, we'll just need to apply the Linus function for linear estimation we'll need to select an array of our dependent variable. So our Y's would be the Tesla returns. Our X's, that is the independent variables, would be the benchmark returns, that is the S&P 500 returns. We'll press one here as we want the alpha to be calculated and reported. And we'll press one here because we want the additional statistics, that is standard errors, R squared, uh, ESS, RSS, and so on, to be reported as well. And we close the bracket, enforce this formula using shift, control, answer, and get the output presented over here. The coefficient are presented in the first uh, row, so we have beta here of 1.27, so we can already see that Tesla, as per this estimation, is riskier than the market in general, that is quite commonsensical, and it has a slightly positive alpha, so no surprises here. So what do we have to do to be able to apply the Durbin Watson stat? Actually, we're quite close to be able to apply it right now. We just need to calculate the expected returns as per this estimation and the respective residuals, and then we'll be good to go. For the expected returns, we'll just need to, for every uh, observation, we'll need to uh, get alpha, and we need to lock the row because we don't want alpha to change observation to observation. It's kind of persistent throughout the sample. That's the purpose of alpha as the intercept. And then we need to add beta, and we need to lock that as well, as we assume that beta is also pretty constant. And we need to multiply it by the respective market return at a particular trading day to figure out the expected return of the Tesla stock at a particular trading day. And we bottom right clicked all the way down, and see what the model predicts are the expected returns of Tesla day by day. The residuals then would just be the differences between the actual returns and the expected returns. In uh, finance, this metric is also called abnormal returns, that is, returns that occurred but were not expected by the model that we're using. And as we've got the residuals, we can already start applying the Durbin-Watson stat finally. So the logic of the Durbin-Watson stat is quite simple. Uh, the Durbin-Watson stat is a ratio of the sum of um, squared differences in residuals. So we'll need to figure out the squared difference between uh, the residual and the respective lagged residual. And in the denominator, 
we'll just have the squared sum of residuals across the sample. So first, we'll just need to figure out the squared difference in residuals to calculate our numerator. That's pretty simple. We'll just have our residual at day two minus our residual at day one and square it. And then bottom right click this formula all the way down. And we can already figure out our numerator. We'll just need to sum this whole array. And this is the numerator of our Durbin Watson stat. Then we need the um, squared sum of the residuals per se. So to uh, speed up the process, we can just apply the sum squared function in Excel that will just sum the squared elements of an array and we'll get 0 0.86. Um, actually, if you pay slightly more attention to what is happening, we see that we have our sum squared residuals in the linest output as well. It's here on the bottom right corner. That's basically the RSS, but it's nice that we had the same uh, output calculated using two different methods. We can be more certain that we haven't made any mistakes yet. And then finally, our Durbin Watson stat would be just the numerator, the sum squared difference in residuals, divided by the sum squared of residuals, so the RSS, as some of you might know it alternatively. And we enforce the formula and get 2.0070. And uh, to interpret the Durbin Watson stat, you need to first know that the Durbin Watson stat uh, fluctuates within the boundaries of 0 to 4, so it can be as low as 0 and as high as 4. And the ideal value of the Durbin Watson stat is right in the middle, it's 2. Um, what does it represent conceptually? Well, 0 would represent total positive autocorrelation. That would mean that, in our case, high returns in the previous day cause higher returns in the current day. And 4 would mean absolute negative autocorrelation, that is, high returns in the previous day would cause extremely low returns in the current day. Uh, in terms of uh, behavioral finance and market inefficiencies, the former would be called underreaction, the latter would be referred to as overreaction. But uh, let's just think about the tolerable boundaries that we would allow our Durbin Watson stat to fluctuate so that we can assume that no autocorrelation is present. Uh, here, the procedure is relatively tricky, and that's one of the limitations of the Durbin Watson stat, as uh, it's relatively hard to actually calculate the confidence intervals for the statistic to actually convert it into a p value, into a probability that there is no autocorrelation, or that there is autocorrelation. But as a rule of thumb, it's generally assumed that the value of the Durbin Watson stat between 1.7 and 2.3, so in those tight boundaries around 2, which is the ideal case, representing the no autocorrelation case, so something that we are happy to see. Of course, there are uh, tables of critical values for the Durbin Watson stat that you can easily look up online but they are relatively bulky, relatively hard to use. So again, that's one of the major limitations and criticisms of the Durbin Watson stat regarding its ease of use. Uh, thankfully, here we have a pretty definite case that there is no autocorrelation as this statistic is remarkably close to two, the value that we're looking for. Um, another criticism of the Durbin Watson stat is that it just tests for autocorrelation of order one, that is serial correlation of order one. It just uh, tests whether returns one day ago or any observations one day ago influence observations today. Uh, it might well be the case that the structure of autocorrelation is much more complicated and, uh, for example, returns two days ago or three days ago or a week ago would influence the returns today. And the Durbin Watson stat simply cannot capture that type of a complicated autocorrelation structure. And more sophisticated tests have been developed to address these limitations. But overall, the Durbin Watson stat is a go to technique to uh, estimate whether there is autocorrelation in your data, and it's a good uh, first line of defense of your regression estimations uh, to protect them against autocorrelation, or at least to detect this nascent enemy of econometricians. 
And uh, that's all for today, and we will proceed with more sophisticated autocorrelation tests in the later videos. As for now, please leave a like under this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, please post any other topics on business, economics or finance you would like me to make videos on. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Thank you very much and stay tuned.